Hello, my name is Lauren Stevenson and I'm a Curatorial Officer for Ironbridge Gorge Museums. I'm here with Ruth Goodman, a social and domestic historian and critically acclaimed author of How to Be a Victorian and How to Be a Tudor. She's also presented several successful primetime television shows including Victorian Farm, The Wartime Farm and most recently Inside the Factory. We're thrilled that she's been carrying out some research for us into women's history, in particular looking at women who worked in industries in the gorge. Really excited to have you here today to talk to us about your research and, and what you've discovered whilst doing it. And I think we should point out firstly, we're actually sat in Jackfield Tile Museum, which was actually a tile factory back in the 19th century. And many of the women who you've been researching actually worked in, in this factory. So before we talk about what you found out, I suppose we should talk about how, how you found it. So what sort of sources did you use to carry out your research? How, how did you discover the things you found out? Well, the most abundant sources of information definitely came from the censuses. So every 10 years we have a snapshot of where everybody is and what everybody is doing within the geographical region. Mm -hmm. And that is just, well, it's a fantastic base to start from. We can work out who everybody is. We've got their names. We know where they live. We know whether they're married or single, whether they've got children or not. How big a household they're living in. Are they living alone or are they living as part of a large family group? And we get, very crucially, an occupation. It tells us what they're doing for a living. And that really allows us to focus in on those women who are engaged in industrial work. So one of the main sources you've used is the census, but were there any limitations to that? Every source is always limited. There are always things that a, a, a piece of information can tell you and things that a piece of information cannot mm -hmm. tell you. And that's very true with the census as it is of everything. So for example, sometimes, you read a census and you read an entry and you think, well, they've got an occupation written down, but that's not actually possible. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you were to read about the inmates in the workhouse, they're very often listed with an occupation, but the whole point of being in the workhouse is you've got no work. Yeah. You're desperate, you're having to go, and nobody wanted to go to the workhouse, you're having to go to the workhouse in order to have enough food to eat and to have a roof over your head. Mm. So, obviously, you're not in paid work and yet the occupations are listed. So one has to be a little bit careful because yeah. it's not just people who are in that situation who might have an occupation listed that they weren't at the moment doing. So for example, if you are a married woman and you've got a four week old baby mm -hmm. and it says China painter, yeah. are you actually painting China four weeks after the birth mm. of the baby? Or are you hoping to go back to it? It's something you did before, you're hoping to go back to it. Maybe you're not doing it just at this moment. So there's all sorts of little bits of ambiguity. We've just recently had another census, haven't we? We've all gone through that process of yeah. filling in our own census forms. And perhaps for some people, it is a really simple matter. Oh, yes, I fit in that box, that box, that box, and that box. But I think many people, and I know it includes me, yeah. actually sort of not quite sure what to put in some of the boxes because it's not... It's not obvious, and you don't really fit in any of the categories. I mean, when it comes to occupation for me, what do I write? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do I write historian, which I do. I mean, I write history books, so I must be a historian. On the other hand, I spend a lot of time doing telly, so should I say I'm a TV presenter? Or should I say both? Um, I don't know, really. How do I describe myself? It's not mm. an easy job title to do. And, and likewise, there are all sorts of other moments of ambiguity. So. You look at the censuses and they tell you information but not everything you want to know. And some of it's not quite as clear cut as you mm. might hope. So what time period were you looking into and what sort of geographical area? Well, I set out to try and look at the whole of the 19th century. But as you can imagine, there was way more information about the second half mm -hmm. than there was about the first half. So I really started hunting, you know, here and there for the first half. And that threw up a few 18th century uh, bits of information which well, it was too good to miss, really. <laughs> so, in truth, I've ended up looking from about 1750 right up to about 1900. Mm. And geographically, again, I try to have a fairly broad sort of overview with more focus on the two parishes at the centre of that, Brosley and Maidley. Um, I did look at Little Wenlock and Wellington and, you know, all around, but it was more concentrated on these two central parishes. 
So what industries have you found women working in, in the Gorge? Well, it's quite a broad selection, really. Um, there are a few in the iron industry, lots in the coal mining, the ironstone mining, the quarrying, a um, little bit with lime. We've seen women working at um, well, things you might expect, perhaps a bit more like boot and shoe making, tile making, brick making, pottery making. It's quite a spectrum. Mm. And were there any significant changes to the types of work women were carrying out over this period? And if so, why was that? Huge, actually. An enormous shift in the sort of work that women are doing. And it reflects a, a national pattern, but is really, really concentrated in this area. And the most important of those is an abandonment of physical labour. So when we look at the 18th and early 19th century, we're seeing a very large number of women involved in heavy manual labour, lifting, shifting. You know, they're carrying bricks, they're carrying clay, they're moving stone, they're loading wagons, they're unloading wagons. Mm. There's no skill involved, this is heavy physical work that more recently we think of as being much more confined to men. But in the 18th and early part of the 19th century, there are loads, hundreds, literally hundreds of women involved in that sort of work. And then it fades right out. And it happens really quite quickly. From about 1860, 1870, you can see the number of women who are being employed in that way just fall right away. Until by 1900, it's almost completely gone. Um, now, this does reflect a national pattern. The idea about what is suitable for women, the nature of women mm. ideologically changes. About 1860 is the shift we see right across the country in which people start to think that women are delicate little flowers, bless us. We really can't, you know? And it comes from a belief about our bodies mm. um, and it comes from a belief about um, our spirits as well. It's a sort of a two-edged mm. thing. It starts with our spirits. In the early 19th century, late 18th century, people start to see, educate, they start to talk about educated women, elite women, as being more refined than men, as being more sensitive, more sensible in that sort of sensitivity sort of a way. People start talking about women being very different in their nature. And this idea is, yeah, people like this idea. This is, gets to be a really fashionable idea. And then the doctors start taking it up mm. and they start thinking, oh yeah, well, women are different. Well, we all know women are different. Everybody knows women are different. We've known for centuries that they're weaker. This, this seems the right sort of thing. Yes, very sensitive. And they get very, very worried about our reproductive organs. Mm. So the medical men start to think that if we do heavy exercise, we will damage our own ability to have children and any unborn children that we're carrying. Well, if you really believe that, then you see a woman doing heavy physical labour, you're mm. going to be worried about it. And so many employers, in utterly good faith, were trying to do the best. Many reformers, in utterly good faith, were saying, no, no, women shouldn't be doing these jobs. This is not right. We can't have women loading carts and unloading carts and shifting stone and carrying bricks. They're going to be damaging their unborn babies. They're going to be ruining their own health. This is bad. And as that attitude moves through society, all the people who are employers are saying, I think I'd better take a bloke to do this. I'd rather not have women doing that. Mm. And the opportunities for working class women to earn from that sort of work just collapse almost mm. overnight. It's really quick. So one of the industries you said women were working in was the iron industry. Um, so did this idea of women and, and labouring, did that affect the sorts of work they did within the iron industry? Mm, I, I think it probably did, but there was already pre-existing within the iron industry a certain sort of unease about mm. the idea of women being involved in iron. Now mm. that seems to have been quite a local thing, actually. If you were to move not very far away, if you go over to Dudley, you'd yeah. find loads and loads of women involved in iron manufacturing mm -hmm. roles. It was, you know, it was well established as being something, particularly something like nail making, yeah. was something that hundreds and hundreds of women were involved in, in a very physical and very hands-on sort mm -hmm. of a way. But you do not see that pattern here in the gorge. Something different is going on. 
out on the, the mine pit banks, mm. there were hundreds of women who were sorting ironstone. They were looking through what was coming up out of the mine and they were sorting out the useful ironstone from the less useful things. Mm. They were loading it into, into wagons, very heavy work. Yeah. But when those wagons reached the ironworks, I have found in 50 years of census, one woman who was involved in unloading it. Mm. One. Not the hundreds who yeah. were loading it, one. There are hundreds of men unloading it mm. and one woman. Now that's weird, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> why, there was migration between these two areas, I mean, black country and here, quite a bit of migration. So why, why do you think this area had such a, a, an opposition to having women working at the sites of our industries like foundries and blast furnaces. It's extremely hard to put your finger on what it mm. is that's motivating people. But you are absolutely right to point out that there is a completely different attitude. Mm. Perhaps one of the, the largest clusters of iron working women I found, and there's five of them, so it's not exactly big. <laughs> five. <laughs> five women who were nail making in mm. the 1870s. Um, and that little cluster seems, as far as I can tell, to be associated with one man mm. who has migrated from Dudley yeah. to this area. It was a chap called Ray, mm. and uh, he came with his family and seems to have set up a little nail manufactory here. Yeah. I don't think it was a big business, and I don't think he had very much capital behind him. Mm. Um, he also went bust pretty quick. Yeah. So although he turns up in the census of 1871, by 1881 he's having to work as a journeyman tanner and, and the next census on he's having to work as a general labourer. So this factory did not do well. Mm. But he had come from Wolverhampton bringing his family with them. They set up here and he was willing to employ women. He had that tradition behind him. He mm. felt comfortable with employing women, so he did none of the local nail makers, and there's plenty of them, mm. employed a single woman. Mm. And we can, find ex, you know, we can find examples of other nail manufacturers set, set up and run by local men, no women. So we're seeing two very different cultures yeah. coming up against each other. And I think that's important to really highlight how the decision as to whether this is a suitable job for a woman or not, mm. is entirely based upon culture. Yeah, it's very local. Very local, very traditional, mm. and based on very little objective outside thinking. Yeah. So one of the other industries you've identified women working in is the Brosley Tobacco Pipe Works. Um, and in the 17th and 18th centuries, this was a very, I guess, craft-based, workshop-based industry. But over, like through the 19th century, it phased more into factory-based production. Did this affect how women participated in that industry at all? That change from craft workshops to factories? I think it did. I think perhaps more in the nature of the work rather than whether they're doing it or not. Mm. Um, so we have evidence of women being heavily involved in pipe making right back into the late 17th century. Mm -hmm. um, and in quite an active role. Um, running businesses, little tiny businesses, or being involved in their husband's business or their father's business. Yeah. Um, and we can find women who were in those positions throughout the 17th and 18th centuries um, and into the 19th century. When the industry begins to become a bit more modern in the second half of the 19th century and you start moving from these little craft workshops which were essentially family based mm. into something that was more like a factory with paid day labourers, we can sort of see women's work becoming more specialised. There seemed to be a similar number of them. Mm. They were still getting work, much like they always had within this industry, but they're doing a smaller part of the process within a factory, which is not that surprising. I expect the same thing happened to the men too. Yeah. <laughs> so the old craft workshops, very, very tiny, basically just a family. There might be an apprentice or a helper coming in, a, a day worker maybe. Basically, it's just the family. So you're looking at a handful of people working together in a space that's probably part of the family home. Mm. Um, and they're doing all of the processes 
probably given a hand with everything. Everybody's yeah. doing everything, probably, to some degree. Within a factory, when you've got much larger numbers of people, each job becomes more separate. Mm. And there are people who are only doing one part of the process. And we see women having job descriptions that reflect that. So instead of being a pipe maker, mm. you become a pipe trimmer ah. or a pipe finisher or a pipe packer, somebody who only packs pipes. Yeah. Very much more divided up as craft workshop becomes factory. Um, so the next industry that really developed in the gorge that women worked in en masse was um, the Coalport China factory in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. So what types of work did you find women doing in that factory? Well, what's really nice about that is the variety of different jobs that are women are being involved in. They're pretty mm. much at most not all, but most of the different areas of, of production. And what's particularly exciting, I think, in looking at that information is that you can see just a hint now and again of a bit of career progression being open to women. Now, this is exciting, the idea that there might be a bit more than just, you know, a repetitive job that you just do that there might be an option for developing a career, for having a bit more pride in your work, being more involved in your work, being rewarded and respected for mm. your skill as well as your, you know, hands moving something. Yeah. Um, and we see this in a number of ways. One is within the, um, the, the painter mm. um, sort of envelope. An awful lot of people are described as being China painters or China paintress. Mm depending on how people want to write it down. But it's also noticeable that a significant portion, proportion of the younger women are, have the word apprentice added to the description, either apprentice China painters or China painters apprentice. <laughs> Not all of them, but quite a number. And this is really part of a, a sort of an ongoing process of learning. And here it is in writing, proving that it's an ongoing process, that skill is building within this one workshop mm. that a young girl has got a long way to go and that she will be valued more later on in her life as a, an adult worker than she was as a young pair of hands and very occasionally too you can see somebody working moving between departments within the china factory which again can give you a, a hint that people are forging some sort of career for themselves mm. within these possibilities i found one lady who started off as a married woman, she may well have worked there as a single woman, I just couldn't find her because yeah. of the name change. She started off as a married woman, as a labourer, so mm. she's just lifting and shifting things. And then she turns up 10 years later as a wheel turner. Mm. Now, that, now that is not the same thing, and actually is more, much more skilled than you can't imagine. Um, some of the small lathes that were used for particularly tricky potting were turned not by machine, but by a person, mm. um, using a great big flywheel. And you, you turn the wheel and a, and a drive belt went and twizzled the, the thing on which somebody else is doing the potting. But this remained important in the industry for careful work because the turned wheel can be turned one way and the other. Mm. And you can change the speeds and the movement really subtly and carefully but with a hand wheel, which you couldn't if a machine was just yeah. spinning regardless. So the person who's wheel turning not only has to have the stamina to turn a wheel and keep it going all day, every day, but to shift and respond and to notice what's going on on the wheel. And there should be an unspoken rapport that you know what sort of speed, what direction is going to be needed. It's quite skilled work. The other ceramic industry you found women working in was the tile factory, so Moore & Co and Craven & Dunnell, this factory being one of them. What roles do you find women filling in those factories? Well, again, it's really quite varied, mm -hmm. but it also takes quite a while to get going. It's quite interesting that the early history of these factories are male, mm. and women only come in sort of afterwards. It's almost like an afterthought. Um, and you find the same thing happening with the sort of new departments, new developments. They seem to be developed with male labour, and only once they've become less interesting and they're much more mainstream do they start bringing workers in, mm. uh, women workers in. So the mosaic element of, of the tyre factories, for example, brand new process that produced a new product, um, hit the market, instant success. 
yet it takes 30 years before women are involved in the production. Mm. That early development phase is a presumably slightly higher status phase. <laughs> I'm guessing there. Um, was, is done by male workers, and it's only once it's become an established run-of-the-mill thing that the factories start taking on women to do that. But once they do, mm. they are quite enthusiastic employers of women. Um, and you can see a lot of movement between workers in the tile industry, female workers in the tile industry, and female workers in the china works. A lot of them are moving back and forth between the two. The sets of skills involved clearly overlap. And women are taking the opportunity to see, well, there's a slightly better position over there. Mm. I'll go over there. Um, and we find many families who are split between the two works in which, you know, you get a bunch of sisters and we're all growing up and then they might start at one factory, one gets a bit fed up there, so she tries it over there. A younger sister might join this and younger, other sisters remain. So there is a bit of movement. And again, I find that interesting yes. that here women are having an element of choice as to mm. where they work and they're able to sort of perhaps leverage a slightly better position. Yeah. Maybe it's it pays a bit better or maybe it's just a nicer bunch of people over there. Or mm. maybe that's a more interesting bit of the work and you can sort of choose. You've got options. That's really interesting, the fact that these women were going between the industries. In other areas, obviously, they work in one industry and work in it their entire lives quite monotonous. But these women had choice and that's really fascinating. Yeah, exactly.